Hey everyone, welcome to First Christian Church Online. As you know, we're so glad that you're here today. Can't wait to be with you. We've got a great day lined up. I hope that you stick through all the way to the end. And please know that our heart is to connect with you. And so we're glad that you're here to watch, but we want to get to know you and connect with you. And so if you would take a second, uh, say something in the chat there. If you're watching, if something strikes you and you have a question about it, uh, ask it in the chat and there'll be a person there to answer that. Um, and then also, if you have something that you just want to talk to a pastor about uh, here at the church, you can go to scottsburg.church. That's our website. And there you can fill out the online connect card. It's right there on the homepage. Click that and we will be in touch with you this week uh, to follow up and see how we can walk with you. Uh, let's take the next few moments. Let's worship together uh, and focus our hearts on the Lord. Not my life to live It's not my song to sing All I have is His For all eternity It's not my right Not my faithfulness. All I have is His for all eternity. We will crown Him. Psalm 27, David writes, The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? He then goes on and he says, The one thing that I ask of the Lord, 
the one thing that I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And David paints this picture for us of dwelling with God under God's protection, knowing that He is the light in the darkness, the light of the world, that He is our fortress, He is everything we need. And uh, the phrase that has always stood out to me in this is that David writes, he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord under the shelter of God all the days of his life. And I think a lot of times we look ahead to that and think that's, that's the future, that's in heaven one day when we get to dwell with God. But I think that we get to dwell with God today. And David's saying we can dwell with God all the days of our life. Here in a moment, we're gonna give you some time to take communion. And it's a time to be with God. It's a time to sit with Him and to talk with Him and to commune with Him, to remember what He did for you and for me. I'd encourage you now, you can gather your elements to take communion, some bread and some juice. Um, And I really do want to encourage you to just take a moment to be still before God, um, to know that He is everything that you need, to dwell with Him. And I hope it encourages you to continue dwelling with Him all the days of your life, uh, just like David encourages us to do in Psalm 27. Let's take communion together now. Hey, everybody. Uh, Welcome back to First Christian Church Online. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Man, I'm really excited to continue this um, study of who Jesus is. And last week, we um, set up this idea that Jesus uses seven um, statements about I am. I am the bread of life. Last week, we talked. This week, we're going to be looking at the second one that he says out of John chapter 8. I am the light in the darkness and exactly what that means. So let's just jump right in it. I don't want to do a bunch of fanfare or something funky or whatever, man. Let's just jump right into Scripture today. John chapter 8. If you have your Bibles with you, if you have your Bible app, I've got my NLT right here. And um, we're going to flip over to John chapter, let me put a page marker here, John chapter 8. Um, and we're going to start with the very first, right off the top, um, verse 1. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. If you continue to read this, you're going to hear um, this story. This account of a woman caught in adultery. It says a crowd gathered. Jesus sat down to teach them. He was speaking, the teachers of the religious law. And the Pharisees, they brought a woman and placed this woman in front of the crowd. This woman had been caught in the act of adultery. Now, if you get the picture, there's a crowd of people. Jesus sat down to teach them. And this group of Pharisees, this group of religious elite law keepers, brings a woman who by law they could stone. They place him in front of Jesus. And I love what they say to him, verse 4. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? And when are they going to learn? Don't ask Jesus. 
those kind of questions. You're basically setting it up for him to tell you what you should do. What do you say, Jesus? The men were trying to trap him to say something that they could use against him. At this point, the Pharisees and Jesus are are not on the same page. What does Jesus do? Being the great teacher that he is, being the master storyteller. Remember last week we talked about painting a picture, and we're here in my office with with all these things around me that remind me um, way back um, to um, Scott Graves, way back in the day, man, um, Simon Peter's Fishing Clinic, back when I first started ministry, um, to, to my years at Purdue, to my years over in Ohio, to my buddy Eric Fuller, who gave me my VIP Reds coffee mug, to, to um, uh, this Purdue tie that I always wore when Purdue beat Ohio State. Just kidding. That only happened a couple times. Um, man, I got stuff all over, Arizona trips, my kids, my family, my wife, Picture of her on our wedding day right back there. Uh, Man, I just love seeing these things because they remind me of the event. They remind me of the truth that was in that moment. They remind me of the relationship. It reminds me of who I am and who Jesus is and who Jesus has been in my life because all of these things in this office, almost all of them, have to do with Jesus being a part of my life somewhere, somehow. Why are we looking at these seven statements of I am? Because Jesus is painting a picture of who he is, and he is telling us what his purpose is. This second statement that Jesus makes here in just a moment is no different. The Pharisees tried to trick him. They kept demanding an answer. Verse 7 So he stood up again. Why did he stand up? Because he bent down to write in the sand. He didn't answer the first question. The woman is there on the ground in front of the crowd. And the Pharisees are waiting because they know they've got him. There Jesus draws in the sand. He stands back up. And then he says, all right. Let the first one of you who have never sinned throw the first stone. What? Uh, Excuse me, Jesus, can, can can you repeat that? Picture yourself being in that crowd that day. I mean, a stoning was not uncommon. Picture yourself in that moment. You're a righteous follower of God. You follow the law of Moses. And here these religious teachers bring a a woman. They throw her in the ground. It says the law of Moses says we can stone her. What do you say, Jesus? Picture yourself in that crowd when Jesus says, all right, if you've never sinned, throw a stone. And then he stoops down again. He bends low to this woman again. And he writes something else in the dust. Well, what happens next is probably the greatest picture. Um, One of the greatest pictures that I've ever seen in Scripture. It says when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one. Beginning with the oldest, because they knew, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. All the Pharisees, all of those who accused the woman are now gone. It's just Jesus and the woman and the crowd. Jesus takes this moment and he addresses the crowd and he stood up again and he says to the woman, where are your accusers? The crowd looking around. Where are these Pharisees? Where are our religious leaders? Where are they? Jesus said, did even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, the woman replies. And Jesus said, neither do I. Get up, go and sin no more. 
Now, that would be the end of the story, right? Not for Jesus and not for us. Verse 12 of chapter 8 says, Jesus spoke to the people once more. Those who were still there, those who had witnessed this whole um, scene take place, he turns to them and he says once more to them, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to life. Why does he use, excuse me, why does he use this idea of light and darkness at this moment? Again, Jesus is telling us who he is and what he's here to do. He's telling us who he is and what he wants us to be. So why light and darkness now? Why does Jesus say, I am the light of the world? If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. He's just spoken with, he's just been with a woman who was caught in adultery, a woman who had a very dark life, a woman who was troubled, a woman who was left out, a woman who was on the outside, a woman who most people would throw out as trash. But not Jesus. You see, he makes a very clear contrast. The world will let you stay in darkness. The world will let you remain in your sin, and the world will have no problem condemning you to death. But that's not why I'm here. I'm not here to keep you in the darkness. I'm not here to tell you how bad you are that you live in the darkness. God knows it. I already know it. God knows the dark parts of your life. But he sent Jesus not to condemn the dark parts of our life, but to show us that there is a difference. To pull us out of the darkness into the light. That's why Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me. You won't have to walk in the darkness alone. You won't have to live in the darkness anymore. You won't have to live with shame and guilt and punishment and condemnation. If you follow me, I'm different. I'm the light of the world. The Pharisees, the religious, they hated him for this. They questioned him. They condemned him. And they would eventually kill him. But Jesus says, I am who I am. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. There are two types of people in this world. This story reminds me every time I read it of the two types of people. First type, the broken and the forgiven. The second the proud, religious, and condemned. You can't be both. You can't be forgiven and be religiously proud. You can't be a Pharisee and a follower of Jesus. You have to give one up to follow the other. You can't be an adulterer and be a follower of Jesus. You have to give one up to be the other. Jesus said, go and sin no more. I'm giving you a new way of living. Without condemning her, he showed her the light. There's an article written called Vegas, the Beacon of Humanity. <laughs> it talks about not, um, not Vegas being a great place or a bad place. It has nothing to do with Vegas really as the place. This article talks about that from space, Vegas is one of the brightest cities at night in the world. From space, astronauts and satellites can show us just how great 
the city of Las Vegas is. Uh, astronaut Don P uh, Piet explains in a Smithsonian documentary, he says, from the first time I flew to the last time, the main effect I saw on Earth was at nighttime. It was the great extent of the lighting. Astronauts love taking pictures at cities at night, he said. But there's one city that stands out. Not because of its size, color, or shape, but because of its brightness. Petit says, I like to refer to Las Vegas, tongue-in-cheek, as the beacon of humanity. I don't know if it's the brightest city on earth, he says, but it's really, really bright. I thought about that. And this quote stood out. This, this part of the article stood out. He says, astronauts love taking pictures of the cities at night. He says, there's one city that stands out, not because of its size, not because of its color, not because of its shape, but because of its brightness. Las Vegas doesn't stand out in space at night because it's the biggest city. It's not because of color or shape. It's because of how bright it is. Think about that for just a moment. If you haven't already gone to where I'm going, maybe we need to rethink this. See, you don't stand out in this world because of the size you are, the color you are, the shape that you are. You don't stand out because you're the best, the brightest. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus says something about being bright. Not intellectually bright, but bring, being the light. So it doesn't matter how big you are, what color you are, what race you are. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. What makes you unique and what stands out is how bright you are. Not intellectually, spiritually. You see, with billions of LED lights, countless billboards and marquees, Vegas generates more light per square mile than any other city on the planet. Las Vegas, at its southern end, at the Strip, there's a beam of light that is projected into the night sky from the Luxor Resort Hotel. It's from the pyramid, the Luxor Pyramid. Curved mirrors are positioned to collect 39 xenon lamps, creating a single narrow beam. This one light, this is unbelievable. This one light source produces 42 billion candle watts of power. Light bulbs, 60 watts. This one beam produces 42 billion candle watts of power. It says this beam is visible by planes flying over Las Vegas, or excuse me, Los Angeles, 270 miles away. It is a true beacon from the heart of the Mojave Desert. This one beam can be seen 275 miles away. It doesn't matter what size, shape, race, color, creed you are. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what has happened to you. It doesn't matter how smart you are, how wealthy you are. What matters in this life may very well be how bright you are, spiritually speaking. You see, Las Vegas is just like any other city out there. It's just a little brighter. And that brightness makes an impact. It's not got the best reputation. But just like the woman caught in adultery, Jesus didn't come to condemn the left out. He came to give them a way out. And I think that's what we need to be reminded of. 
John chapter 8. Listen to this again. And, and think about why Jesus said what he said when he said it. He's telling us who he is and what he's doing. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, after speaking to the Pharisees, after speaking to the woman, he speaks to the crowd once more. He wants to give them the bottom line, the foundation, the truth. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to live in darkness anymore because you will have the light that leads to life. Woman, you don't have to lead this life anymore. You have a choice. So get up and follow me. N.T. Wright. He said, God lighting a candle. You don't light a candle in a room that's already full of sunlight. You light a candle in a room that's so murky that the candle, when lit, reveals just how bad things really are. God already knows your heart. God already knows your situation. God already knows what you're going through. He already knows what life you live, you lead. He knows my deepest, darkest secrets. He knows the places that are in the corner that when the light shines on are pretty messy. And he knows yours as well. But Jesus did not condemn the woman. He did not leave her left out. He gave her a way out. Today, Martin Luther King's words should remind us, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Pain cannot drive out pain. More sin cannot drive out sin. Condemnation cannot bring forgiveness. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. There's a book by Phil Cook and Jonathan Bach. They asked some pretty significant questions about the church. He said, why did the early church succeed where this modern church is failing? How did they transform the Western world in such a relatively short time? How did the early church do these things that baffled the Romans? Their answer? The early church didn't pick it. The early church didn't boycott. The early church didn't gripe about what was going on in their culture. The early church didn't yell and scream about how bad and sinful the Romans were. Cook and Bach simply said they did things that astonished the Romans. Better said, they were light in the darkness. They didn't try to speak into the darkness. They just simply tried to be the light. Cook and Bach say they took in the Romans' abandoned babies. They helped the sick and the wounded. They restored dignity to those who were enslaved. They were willing to die for what they believed in. And after a while, their actions so softened the hearts of the Romans that these darkened Romans wanted to know more about these Christians who were representing the God that they followed. In a world that seems so dark, in a world that seems so divided, what did the early church do? Without confrontation, without protest, without debate, they simply loved their communities. They loved those around them. They did what Jesus did. 
They showed the dark world how to be light. Folks, darkness will never win. John 1 says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. The people of light are always going to be generous and compassionate. That's what makes them people of light. Psalm 112, verse 4, light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassionate, and right and compassionate and righteous. Following the light, living in the light always leads to peace. Luke chapter 1, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. The light will always show us God's goodness. 1 Peter chapter 2, you're not like that, for you're a chosen people. You're a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For God called you out of darkness. He called you into his wonderful light. And to borrow a phrase from a new friend, Ben Woods, the light always looks for the left out. And I would add, the light always provides a way out. 1 John chapter 2. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you are also living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. What was this command? To love one another. Howard Hendricks in a book called Beyond the Bottom Line, says the main problem with Christians, American Christians especially, is not that they aren't what or aren't where they should be, but they are not what they should be right where they are. Let me say it again. The problem with American Christians is not that they aren't where they should be, but, but that they are not what they should be right where they are as doctors, housewives, lawyers, teachers, computer salesmen, nurses, etc. We're in the places that we need to be. God has placed you where you're at. He has put you in the middle of the darkness. Just maybe because he knows you can be the light. Principals, doctors, factory workers, farmers, stay-at-home dads, moms, brothers and sisters, students, athletes, coaches. Have you ever stopped to think? that God has put you right where you need to be. And he's waiting on you to be what he wants you to be. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled under as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light for everyone in the house. (laughs) I'll leave you with this. Charles Spurgeon. The Bible is not the light of the world. It is, however, the light of the church. But the world does not read the Bible. The world reads Christians. The Bible is not the light of the world. You are the light of the world. The world is watching. The world is waiting to see what you will do.
with the woman at your feet? Will you be Jesus or will you be something else? God bless you. Have a great week. And go be the light. Someone's waiting for it. Someone needs it. Have a great week. so glad that you were able to be with us today and stick it out here till the end. Thanks for doing so. We would love to follow up with you and help you take your next step. I don't know what that looks like for you today, um, but whatever that is, 
uh, we're here for you. And so you can leave a comment in the chat. You can head over to the website at scottsburg.church and fill out an online connect card. Either of those ways would be a great way for us to be in touch. Um, and we would love to just follow up and see how we can help you take your next step. And maybe that's even the first step in knowing more about following Jesus. Uh, and we're right here for you to help you with that. So again, thanks for being here. We'll be back next week. We can't wait to see you then. Have a great week. God bless. We'll see you soon.